there's a lot of infighting about this, that, the other, open gov, everything. It's just, it's like you walk into a room and everything's on fire and you're like, what am I doing? Like, what is going on here? I think it's a really tough mission uh, you guys are going after. A lot of sleepless nights, maybe, I don't know, but uh, maybe you're used to it from the Moonbeam days. We're definitely used to it. Uh, we're excited for the challenge. All right, thank you for tuning into another episode of the Teach Me DeFi podcast. Um, today, we'll be talking a lot about the Polkadot ecosystem and about marketing and everything that comes with that topic. Uh, I, I'm happy to say we got Katie here and Nate from uh, co-founders of the project Distractive. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Doing great. Hanging in there. Sweet, sweet. I think for you guys, it's uh, in the morning right now, is it? Yeah. Yeah. First thing on Monday. After a very long Thanksgiving weekend. So a lot of dust to uh, knock off. All oh, right. Right. Yeah, true. You guys, uh, we don't have that here. So I didn't have like a big dinner or anything, but uh, <laughs> lucky, uh, lucky you guys. It is a nice weekend for sure. <laughs> cool. Um, I mean, before we dive into like the nitty gritty of... Um, what you guys are doing. Uh, I've read your forum post on the Polkadot forum and all that. Um, maybe we just start off with um, what's distractive? What what are you guys doing? Um, and how did the project come about? Sure, um, I can start. So distractive is a marketing and growth agency that originated earlier this year as part of some of the decentralization activities that we were undertaking uh, from the Moonbeam team. So Distractive right now is the BD and marketing contributors for Moonbeam. And there's also other entities that have formed over the last years uh, from an operational team, a developer relations team, an engineering team. And these are all totally separate from the foundation. So on the Moonbeam side, we've been really proactive about decentralizing the contributors. And so now when we're looking ahead to taking on other clients and operating um, as an independent agency, there's a lot of really exciting stuff coming up, but our, our Polkadot expertise uh, means that we have a lot of really interesting opportunities in the Polkadot ecosystem that we're particularly excited about. Okay, lovely. And um, so like, like you said, it kind of like um, you started at Moonbeam, um, now Moonbeam decentralized more and, and Distractive is, is something that you have co-founded uh, in the area of marketing. What's... Um, What's the current status of it? What what are you guys proposing to do for the ecosystem? For the Polkadot ecosystem? Yeah. Um, do you want to give a summary, Nate? Yeah, I mean, so so I want to make it clear. I mean, we we continue to work on Moonbeam and, and contribute there. Um, but we still do a lot there. And as Katie mentioned, there's just more and more folks that are coming into the Moonbeam ecosystem that are kind of taking specific pieces and focusing on on areas there. And so, you know, we now kind of have the bandwidth to start looking at bringing on other projects. And so uh, the timing kind of worked out perfectly to be able to contribute more uh, back to the Polkadot ecosystem. And so uh, about six weeks ago, Parity announced kind of their decentralization efforts, really focused on kind of their marketing and BD uh, teams, as well as I think some other some other pieces as well. Um, but so it, it kind of left this opportunity for, for outside contributors to uh, they call agents step up and offer services uh, to the Polkadot ecosystem uh, in the Web3 Foundation. Um, and so it was kind of like perfect timing. Katie and I chatted about it. We've been building in Polkadot for about four years. She and I were part of the original ambassador uh, crew that they kicked off back in 2019. There's a really awkward video. Everybody should go check it out uh, of us talking about uh, about joining. Um, but like we've been here a long time. Uh, Katie's contributed a ton on the marketing side. I've worked very closely with the BD teams over the past four years. And so, you know, we, we kind of saw what the Web3 Foundation was looking for in the bids that they were kind of going to market for. Uh, and so we decided we'd step up and put one in and we'll see kind of where it goes um but we're excited to hopefully contribute to the uh to the polka dot eco uh katie feel free to add to that so this particular proposal uh nate kind of uh, cued me up for this but so the particular proposal that we've put in is really two components the first is that we're sort of volunteering in many ways to be uh the one that's helping to define what's the north star what does polka dot need to be doing where do we want to go and I think that's a really tough concept in a decentralized world to figure out. 
right? And that's mm-hmm. where we've seen the most conversation, even on the forum proposal, is like, how do you have a leadership position while still having the collaboration and decentralization that is sort of inherent to the community and, and the types of teams that we want to see? Um, and I have sort of an idea of what that would look like. And we can talk more about that later. Um, and then the second component is to provide some core level of marketing services to back that up. So mm-hmm. in my world, like I see this being most successful if there's at least some continuity, there's some base level of, you know, you reach out to Polkadot on the website or Telegram or wherever it is and someone answers. <laughs> and so I think there's <laughs> components of that that we're trying to make sure are maintained. But oh, by the way, like, there's some really interesting community members that we think would be great as part of the Polkadot team that we'd love to bring in the fold as part of Distractive and help offer services. There's some great contributors right now at Parity who maybe haven't um, been able to contribute in the ways that they've always wanted or, or, or would like to take on a different type of role. So I think there's a really interesting opportunity to sort of hit the, the refresh button a little bit mm-hmm. and see if we can rethink the way that we're approaching Polkadot, hopefully clean up the message a little bit and then go forward, um, hopefully with some sort of cohesion. And I think that's the part that I, I worry the most about in this decentralized world is how do we look and feel like one body, um, even though we are many teams. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's really what the post is, is proposing. Right. No, that's super interesting. And I'm looking forward to, um, dig deeper on that, like decentralization as a process and how to achieve cohesion and like aligned efforts, um, which are fast and efficient and all that. Um, but before, before we go into that, uh, perhaps as a little creative, uh, question, um, if you would imagine distractive, uh, had to market a blockchain on Mars, let's say, right on a planet of Mars, um, let's say you could envision the different ecosystems there as bases or whatever. You got Polygon, you got Cardano, whatever, you got the Polkadot ecosystem base. How would the Polkadot ecosystem be perceived at the moment as it is? And what would you do as a, let's say, first out of world uh, strategy, marketing strategy to, to kind of market that base and increase traffic users? Um, builders there. Uh, the, the Mars component of this is really throwing me through a loop. I just say <laughs> the rest of it is like a fairly standard question. So I'll, I'll try to incorporate the Martian piece. So I think there's a couple of things that I hear time and time again. And even when we were chatting earlier, you had mentioned um, this like echo chamber kind of feeling mm-hmm. where it's, it's everyone who's in the polka dot space is isolated. They're not working with other teams outside of polka dot in the same way that you might want to see for a platform that talks about interoperability. Um, There's this huge technical hurdle and it is really a barrier. I think what, what I've seen in the Polkadot ecosystem is there's like a point of pride, especially from the engineering teams about attracting the best of the best because there are such high technical hurdles. Um, But that is a deterrent for other people. And so Mm -hmm. the most common sentiment that I hear is something along the lines of, it seems like there's something really special, like people who are into polka dot are really smart and they're really into it, but I don't get it. Like, I don't really understand it. And most, I think, just upsettingly, uh, we don't hear people describe polka dot in any sort of cohesive way. And I don't know that we can 100% overcome that by just shifting the message, but I hear, like, I've always described it as sort of a different way, a new way to build blockchains. And mm they've taken this sort of like revolutionary approach to completely overhaul the way that blockchains interact with each other. If you look at the Polkadot website, it's much more centered on the transactional pieces, right? We're a block space ecosystem. If you talk to other people, they might focus on, um, you know, the scalability, the environmental sustainability. They might talk about XCM, although we don't hear very many people outside of Polkadot talking about XCM, which is that cross-chain stuff. So um, it, in my world, I don't think I have the answer for what the the message should be quite yet, but I really want to dig into it. And in my view, the way that we would sort of help overcome some of the obstacles that we've seen is to stop talking about Polkadot as a technology, which is like that bottom most layer. And there's other things that sit on top of it. And instead to talk about it like a platform, Right. And so I'll give the briefest shout out to Hutch and Liz, because I've stolen this analogy from them. Um, They 
had talked about Nintendo, right, as the mm-hmm. sort of ideal brand. And Nintendo has games. And when you're playing those games, you're fully immersed in them. It's a very um, kind of uh, total experience when you're playing them that you don't really think about the platform. But when you start it up, you see the Nintendo, there's sort of like a brand aesthetic to Nintendo. There's components that live outside of it. The Wii characters have a very specific design. And so there's all these other components that tie into what is Nintendo. But at the end of the day, like, it's a console or it's a platform or it's any of these number of things. And so I I hope that we can start to broaden the definition of what Polkadot is and to encompass not just builders, but the other communities that have been in the Polkadot space. Like Nate and I are a perfect example. We've been in the Polkadot space for four and a half years. We're not builders. And there's a lot of people who I think fall into that bucket who are very enthusiastic, but are maybe not really part of the narrative right now. Right. What do you think, Nate? Yeah, I think uh, I think right now um, it's kind of an intimidating space to come into. I mean, to be to be honest with you, like the the barriers from a tech perspective are extraordinarily high, and so break that down to like non techies, and and you know you might show up and you're like, I don't even know what to do here, and not to mention that you know right now it's just it's just uh, uh, there's a lot of infighting about this, that, the other, open gov, everything. It's just, it, it's like you walk into a room and everything's on fire, and you're like. What am I doing? Like, what is going on here? Mm. But I think that, like, ultimately, I think that a lot of what's going on right now is good. I think that the, you will see good things come from this. You sometimes just need to let the fire kind of burn a little bit, and then new things will kind of sprout up. Um, but we do need to like expand the way that we talk about polka dot, a way the the way that the market looks at polka dot, the way people perceive polka dot. Because, like, like Katie mentioned, uh, it, it's almost uh, uh, you know. People who like licorice really like licorice. People yeah. who like polka dot really like polka dot. <laughs> and we need to kind of expand that from just licorice and just polka dot or figure out the best way to get folks to understand why like the tech is so good. And so things that that Katie and I have been talking about is if you look outside of just core polka dot, the amount of teams using the polka dot SDK to build is massive. And they're like, there are teams in the top like 100, top 200 that are using it. And and so I think that there needs to be a way to, to kind of showcase how great the tech is and then attribute it back to why Polkadot is even better than being a substrate standalone chain and just using substrate because that's where you can drive more builders to come back uh, kind of into Polkadot. So uh, it, I think Katie's right that I think we have ideas, but ultimately, you know, if we're tasked with kind of what we want to do, I think what we would want to do is engage with the community on what they want to see happen, how they want to message this, how they think it should be messaged, but then also work with the Web3 Foundation and work with Parity to make sure that, you know, they are still core contributors to this. They're building it. They're helping fund it. They need to have a seat at the table that says, like, how do you see the, the world here? Now, it shouldn't just be Parity that dictates everything moving forward. That's where the community needs to come in. And that's where I think Distractive can be that bridge to say, we're listening to both sides of this. Here's where we think it, it would make the most sense and kind of help kind of build to that. Mm. Um, in terms of engaging with the community, there's been instances in the past where um, it didn't go ideally, perhaps. Um, we had the logo decision um, where we were presented with two different options uh, and well, you, you you got kind of, the community was engaged at the very end. So to say, these are the two options that we already developed out and now say which one uh, you prefer. And I think to me, the two options weren't that enticing. Um, and I think there was a bit of um, disappointment in that. So if we take that instance, for example, how how could that have been done better? How would you have done it differently? And perhaps how how can issues like that be avoided in in the future? I have so many opinions on that project. Um, (laughs) I was part of it too. I'm not sure if that was clear. Uh, No, it wasn't actually. So sorry if I was too hard on it. No, (laughs) no. I had my disagreements over over some of it. So uh, to to catch everyone up. So this was, I think, almost a year long project. I wasn't involved the entire time, but I was involved sort of, I don't know, in the spring of 2021, as a marketing contributor, right? Marketing person in this in the Polkadot ecosystem to help provide brand feedback. And so I think I had attended a couple of meetings through January through April or something, and then heard nothing. And then it was like something happened and 
we're thinking, thinking, thinking. And then this logo came out of it. And uh, I feel like I was much more involved, much more tied to that project. And that was my experience. So I can only imagine what it was for the community who hears about this massive project. It was, I think, a year in the making. There was a lot of uh, concern put into things like, how do we structure the multi-sig so that things can be approved in a certain way? But that mm-hmm. wasn't probably where the priority should have gone in terms of how do we develop a plan that everyone feels good about. So <clears throat> on my side, I think there's a couple things that went well and a couple things that probably didn't go well. The first is there was a massive information collection effort as part of that. And mm-hmm. even in the most recent brand project, I've seen that as well. There's sort of this, like, how do we immerse ourselves in the ecosystem, see what's happening, capture some important feedback, and then, um, you know, suss out the most important details. And so I think that's always a great place to start. Where this becomes, I think, tricky is you want to keep the, the feedback about branding decisions to people who maybe have some understanding of what you're trying to do in branding and um, have some sort of subject matter expertise. Uh, but that ended up being like, a very small number of people and where things get really hard, particularly with marketing is there's always a bias for people who are outside of the marketing discipline toward things they see. Right. So even we see this today with some of the proposals going through the polka dot treasury, there's a bias toward, well, we just need to hire more influencers Mm -hmm. and okay. But like when things end up on Twitter, it's not always because you paid some influencer, like some of that's organic Some of that is based on market movements. Some of that is based on a campaign that you may be running or news that you had. Like there's a lot of things that go into Mm. that thing that you saw on Twitter. And so I think branding is much the same way where people kind of see the output and they react to the output. Um, But I think I can say that we're all very universally disappointed with the like no opportunity to give feedback. Um, And even as one of the people who was sort of pretty involved in that project, like I got those two logo options and I was like, these are, <laughs> these are not great. Like uh, just dots of the, I, the what logo that's ended up being adopted. My feedback at the time was that it looked like the paper confetti dots that you throw up in the air and they have sort of no dimension and they land. So I'd say <clears throat> um, there was an opportunity for anyone really to give feedback. Once the, the logos had started to be developed, there was an opportunity certainly for the community to give feedback. And then I'd also say it's really hard to find a way to take that feedback productively and put it back into something. So we're never going to reach a unanimous de- decision. I can tell you, I've done dozens of branding projects over the years. There's never a whole team that loves the logo, no matter how yeah. it looks or um, what the brand name is. Like there's always at least 50% of the team that hates it. And yeah. so with the community, you just get louder voices and more discontent. And so it's really hard to take that and say, well, which of these voices are good feedback? Like, what do we, what do we incorporate? And then of course, there's the goal of the project at the time it was to differentiate the polka dot P icon. So when you see the dot token that there's something to associate it with, with it, that wasn't the P. And so it did achieve that, even though I, I don't think any of us are necessarily enamored with the polka dot logo that came out of it. So that's a very long-winded way of saying um, more checkpoints is really the key here at a minimum. And then if, if at least from my perspective, if I'm struggling to find ways to incorporate the feedback that is helpful and productive and will help move the project forward, I think just being clear about that and, and saying like, look, here's the feedback we've received. Here's the ones that seem actionable or here's the ones yeah. that seem to guide us toward a goal. And these other ones are very interesting. <laughs> but not necessarily relevant right now or not necessarily going to help us. And I I find that that's the sort of exercise I have to do in messaging very often, especially with technical people Mm. who will have very distinct perspectives on how to describe something or what the most important attribute of Polkadot or any other technology is. And it's like, while true and accurate, that needs to go over here for half a second because we're trying to drill into something a little higher level. Um, So trying to lay that out, paint the Mm. picture and to explain what the feedback is, why it's being prioritized in a certain way, and just keep that dialogue open. Mm. And so I'm hoping even for the forum, we can do things like have like a marketing collaboration channel. And that is sort of like an open conversation because the other piece that's missing when you do this sort of like 
push out of messages that is, you know, the traditional corporate marketing style of doing things, you miss stuff. And mm. so I'm hoping we can do things like hear more from other regions that maybe Distractive doesn't operate in or Parity doesn't operate in and hear more about what's happening. Uh, I know there's certain pockets of Asia, um, particularly I'm thinking of like Vietnam and Korea and Philippines and Thailand, like there's just a ton of activity right now. Mm. And we need to be hearing about what's happening there. We need to kind of keep a pulse of it and make sure that's getting pulled into Polkadot right. as a brand. So there's a, a lot of subtle shifts. I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's really just keeping the conversation open continuously and really just providing a lot of information where we can. And it's going to be overwhelming at first, but we'll, we'll kind of over communicate and then dial it back as needed um, just to make sure folks can, you know, feel more involved, but can also have some transparency about what we're working on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a few things there. Um, so yeah, engage with the community, you're saying, um, get some feedback, but uh, have people structure that feedback so it's actionable. Um, so you kind of like cut through the noise um, and you can get things done. That's that's what I heard. Um, finally, still sometimes the old logo is used a lot if some um, some media outlets are covering Polkadot. Yeah. Um, and another thing is that i'm not sure if there they ha there have been i would like to hear your opinion on on this if there have been some missed op opportunities in pushing the polkadot messaging um you mentioned that some blockchains are building with the polkadot sdk um recently we had some announcements you see you see on twitter some community members posting about it and trying to kind of um um dial up the volume on hey this is polkadot sdk being used there and trying to spread the message but um perhaps there was no like uh aligned efforts to to make sure these narratives um are heard um yeah what, what do you think about these these um aspects these things yeah i mean so i'll take the, the second part of that um i, I just think that in in a market like today, you really need to focus on where traction is and then hopefully drive it back to some of the core things that you care about. I think ultimately, you know, uh, everyone in Polkadot cares more about just like the Polkadot eco. And, and so that's where I think a lot of the messaging had pointed developers to come build directly in Polkadot. But at the same time, you know, it, it may not be a perfect fit for some of the teams. And so still being able to offer you know, the tech works great, but like offer some support and some, you know, like all of branch to say, great, Substrate's awesome to use. I understand you may not be ready or you may, you know, your use case might not fit perfectly for Polkadot right now, but like they should still get support. I, I At least that's just my take. I think that like ultimately, if you are supporting all of these teams that are using your underlying tech, that is ultimately going to drive more people to look at your tech, understand your tech and you know, you may not get 100 out of 100 to come build new parachains or build on kind of the core Polkadot. But ultimately, if you're if you're continuing to win the developers, well, maybe there's new projects that they spin off and say, hey, you know, bootstrapping all these validator nodes wasn't the best. I, I could actually just get shared security from Polkadot. Let's just go build this new thing on Polkadot. So it's, mm -hmm. it's more of like a longer term vision to say like, yeah, Substrate well, Polkadot SDK uh, is just great technology and anyone using that should get support. Ultimately, we'd love you to be building on Polkadot. We see a lot of value of having you on Polkadot and driving driving even more teams to kind of build there. But they, I don't know, I feel like they, they shouldn't be left out in the cold just because they they decided they wanted their own kind of, you know, chain essentially, but using Substrate. So uh, Katie, I don't know if you had, had something to add to that. Um. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts. The first is that, for better or for worse, mainstream media really doesn't care much about what's going on outside of um, Ethereum and Polygon, and to some degree Avalanche, but mostly Ethereum, Polygon, and some of the L2s. Um, a lot of that is because we try to use media as a predictor, right? Like, what's going to happen? But it's really better used as what already happened, right? They want to mm -hmm. see... They want to yeah, see um, the receipts. In a lot yeah. of ways. Same for markets. So yeah. for Polkadot, that's super hard because this whole endless specialization thing that was and is one of the core differentiators of Polkadot and one of the reasons that the Moonbeam team picked Polkadot to build on 
um, ends up being really difficult when you're trying to say things like, how many people are using Polkadot? How many transactions are happening? How many wallets are there? There's not an easy way to do that. And because we've always focused on Polkadot, the tech layer, Polkadot, the layer zero, Polkadot, just the most bottom base level mm. of functionality, that's what people see. They see only <laughs> that core amount of activity. But really, it should be the sum of all of the activity happening across all of the different chains mm -hmm. that are connected or assume in the future these like pay as you go. Um, I don't know what they're calling parathreads, but the pay as you go parachains. Pair yeah, yeah. And so is that a that, good name? Is that marketable? <laughs> I, I think that some of the renaming has been really helpful. Yeah. Like the polka dot SDK makes a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, it feels like, I don't know if I just don't get the memo when things actually happen. Yeah. So the name changes, I feel like at some point we just need to start adopting the new one, but I don't know if and when those things happen necessarily. Oh, so yeah. That's why I'm not, I don't know the name. Yeah. Um, it's not clear from what point on, like that's the new yeah. uh, language. I think there was, it was something similar with um, Polkadot and Kusama. For a while it was like Dotsama, like kind of merging the two in one word, but then you were <sighs> I think not. I like the to use Dotsama. For, I just think it like I mean we we used it until recently because we're not supposed to. But uh, I I like that terminology just because it is a bigger ecosystem and yeah. we like the Kusama like wild cousin branding. I think they did a really great job with that. They had a good branding. Yeah, I liked it. There was one um, promotional video. I don't know when that came about or whatever. It was sort of cypherpunk undergroundy. It had this rebellious message. Do you know which one I mean? With fast cuts, underground, sort of um, this this woman speaking in a bit of a robotic voice. So I, I really I like mean, that. I remember there were a lot of promotional vehicles with like the expect chaos with yeah. sort of like a jittered text effect. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm picturing that exact video. Yeah. But Maybe I'll put it rate, in the show notes. Um, I'll send it to you. <laughs> I think from a promotional perspective, there's there's real barriers in getting coverage for Polkadot. Some of it, we're sort of doing a disservice to ourselves by not having a way to point to things that they should be looking at, right? Like we have this developer metric that we point to again and again and again and again. And yes, it's true and like very interesting, um, but it's it's visible because uh, there's one place, there's one standardized place that we can compare across. And we mm -hmm. don't really have that to the same degree for wallets or transactions, certainly not even in, in subscan, right? Like Moonbeam mm. transactions, because we have the EVM, only a fraction of them are, are showing up in subscan. Mm. And so there's a lot of activity that we can't capture numerically and sort of add together and show from a Polkadot perspective. So as much yeah. as the interoperability is built in, into the layer zero through substrate at the macro level, like it's not really working to manifest as, as a core data point that we can share. And that's yeah. a disservice because we need to be able to prove to publications that maybe are skeptical or doubtful of some of the stuff happening in the polka dot space, yeah. like to, to show them what activity we see, the energy that we see coming from the space. Right. I think some of these figures have been, um, under uh reported as well like um um in in those um like tvl i believe was isn't um accumulated properly in some of those um standardized sites like you said which show all the blockchains and the tvl or whatever or transaction count um yeah i think um yeah like you said this is um unfortunate because if it, there's a metric that is actually better but then you you're pushing out the the lower one um not ideal yeah 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 it turns into a perception issue right i mean i, I think it, it, it yeah and i, I do think that the rebranding to polka dot sdk was was huge uh because ultimately like katie mentioned for things like marketing and uh and media if somebody's building on substrate you know it might get a, a substrate mention but if for just somebody breezing through, they may not know what Substrate is. So being able to have it branded, the Polkadot SDK, I think brings a lot of value back to Polkadot. And so I think there is a lot more that can be done around that and making sure that teams who are building that can be supported. Right. Um, I saw you You mentioned as a first step, fix the message. And we've, we've been talking a bit about the messaging now. Um, What's wrong with the messaging? You kind of alluded to it already, but if I ask uh, explicitly, what's wrong with the messaging 
um, of Polkadot. How can we fix it? Um, and what are the next concrete steps that you want to take to accomplish these goals? Um, I think from the messaging standpoint, you know, my experience is, I think, very similar to the community's experience with the brand where there was sort of like a lot of magic happening. And then like we spat out this message and it's like, well, that doesn't really seem to work for like how we experience both of that. Right. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. The first is that this block space message, it really commoditizes what Polkadot does, right? It's not, you know, a robust technology or ecosystem or platform. It's just sort of like, meh, you can purchase block space. And that isn't why we chose Polkadot, right? Like that isn't mm -hmm. sort of the driving factor. And what becomes really tricky, and I think how this message was, was sort of landed on, is that there's so many different kinds of teams building on Polkadot and you can't make them all happy and you can't uh, find a message that will ring true for all of them. Um, so I think that's sort of where this message originated is my guess. Um, my perspective is that we need to go up a level and to find a way to talk about Polkadot that isn't a descriptor of the technology that is something um, kind of speaking to a higher order. So what I see happening now are macro movements around, you know, there's whole communities and generations feeling left out by the current economic status in all sorts of countries all over the world. Um, and that's sort of exacerbated by many countries who have sort of like rampant inflation issues at the moment. So people are feeling like this wasn't built for me. This wasn't meant for me. I'm not part of this. And so with that sort of sentiment and, and idea, it feels like Polkadot has a really interesting opportunity to say like, no, no, like come be part of this, come join us. And it shouldn't be like, here's our technology. We built this, you go use it. It should be a much more inclusive, like let's go try to build something really interesting together where build is not, you know, clicking on a keyboard, software engineering. I think it's, it's a much more community focused message. So I know that's really vague. I don't have the answer exactly for what the message should be, but I would love to sort of incorporate those higher order thoughts to try and talk about Polkadot in a much more aspirational way while not losing you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what Polkadot actually does. So for me, this is you know product marketing 101, right? Like you're creating your messaging hierarchies. And so I think we have the, what does Polkadot do? Maybe we would rephrase and, and sort of you know move things around, but like, why are we doing it? And how are we doing it? Those things we don't necessarily do a great job of explaining right now. Mm -hmm. So trying to think that through, think through our audiences a little bit more. I hear a lot of like, well, retail. Well, who's retail? Which part of retail? Like we're not going after, we're not talking to a, a really broad sector of, of folks. We're talking to, um, probably folks who are a little more offbeat, who maybe don't care quite as much about, um, you know, being the first in a space, but they're just like, when they get into something, to Nate's point, like they really get into it, right? Like mm. they just have that enthusiasm. And I think there's like a personality component that we haven't really thought through. We haven't started to describe and to sort of draw and paint a picture of who those people are and how they interact with dApps, right? If we're going to help the dApps on Polkadot get users, we have to know what those users look like. And anyone who's been in the crypto space knows that for the last five years, we've just been trading dApp users back and forth, right? They've sort of migrated from app to app to app. And nobody's really been able to solve the how do we bring more people in. And I don't know that by ourselves, we would be able to solve that. But I think trying to actually think through like, what things would they use? Who are they? Where do we find them? That will just allow us to have a more targeted message for sure. But in general, like a more targeted messaging strategy to once we've started to like really understand these groups a little bit better. Super interesting way you framed it. Uh, sort of that from the te technological perspective, you got this commoditization of block space now, but that also sort of leads to a more commoditized uh, marketing message. Did I get that right? I mean, that's my view. I know I've, I've heard different perspectives from different folks on the block space messaging. Um, and mostly universally, it's that it, it doesn't seem to ring true for their particular experience, right? There's something that's not quite a match there. Um, but the commoditization part is really my view that 
you know, if you're just buying blocks and you can buy blocks anywhere, there's no brand loyalty. Like, why would you yeah. care about where you buy the blocks if, if you were already built on the Polkadot SDK and you can purchase blocks somewhere else, then why wouldn't you do Like, there's a lot of components, yeah. I think, that get left behind. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't think that that, I think there's more to that message that I probably just don't know yet. And I'm hoping to get yeah. kind of more context on some of the, the background to that. But yeah, I, I can't attest to any particular community member's view, but like, I just feel like it, it doesn't quite capture some of the yeah. really important stuff that we see happening from Polkadot tech users every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it almost sounds like the, um, to, that there is like sort of this gap to breathe more life, more human qualities, more personality into the um, awesome tech that is being built instead of just saying, hey, here's the tech, you, you can do anything on this to kind of be like also things like why should you build here? Why should you build in this ecosystem? There's all these other people here that are... Um, um, inclined in such and such way and, uh, you know, like are helpful and it's a very cohesive community or whatever. Um, so th these things get lost if you only stick to the technical, um, aspects. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we've, we, we've, we've just seen for years that, that Pogra has consistently had, we feel the best tech, but the marketing has to expand from just kind of focusing on tech and it's got to be like, why besides just tech would you come build here? You know? And so working through some of the, uh, the community aspects, the, you know, the growth aspects, the, I mean, marketing security can be hard, uh, but I think it, it, it should be woven into the the narrative, but it, it, it definitely needs to go like a level higher than just focusing on like just pure block space, just buy a block here. Uh, why would you build buy a block here? Why would you want to build here? There should be reasons that, you know, you don't move to a country just because it's super cheap. You, there's got to be other things. Hmm. Yeah, maybe there are some people who just move because it's super cheap, but uh, <laughs> there's got to be other reasons and you've got to figure out the best way to kind of market that to a broader audience, whether it's builders or whether it's retail. We had the recent reorganization which you already um, alluded to um, amongst parity, um, I believe um, business development and mar marketing um, functions were reduced um, to a large extent. So what is your view or Distractive's view um, in how to fill these gaps that are left in marketing? You mentioned there's a bit of a tension around um, treasury proposals being about, oh, let's just... Um, um, give money to these different influencers, but there's no real strategy behind it. It seems a bit chaotic. Um, also, I like this quote from your forum post, which said, decentralization is a process. It takes time and a great deal of coordination to ensure we move and execute as a cohesive pack. Um, also, you said, avoid the bystander effect where everyone is waiting for everyone else to initiate change or lead the charge. Um, can you expand on this a bit? Um, because I, fi I find it interesting. Um, it's an interesting topic, um, how to balance between decentralizing, but also running a fast, efficient and coordinated effort towards a joint goal. I, I feel like there, there's, there's tension there, there's trade-offs there. Um, yeah. Can you just expand on this a bit? Yeah. So Oh, I have so many thoughts. I think the first is I use this analogy of a school of fish um, because it's really difficult to sort of describe what the ideal is in my view, but I would love to see a world where there's many sort of contributors that all sort of are moving in the same direction, even if you can't exactly pinpoint why. And so really what we're volunteering to do is say like, we're going to swim a little bit faster, maybe or a little bit, you know, try and point us in the right direction. But what we don't want to do is be the ones that are sort of like dictating what happens um, in sort of an authoritarian way, because that's not my view of decentralization. Mm. And there's a fine line. And so you mentioned the, the bystander effect. Um, I, I've always heard this referred to as like, you know, you don't say someone call 911, you say you call 911, right? You need to give someone the job mm. to do because otherwise... Yeah. Everyone kind of assumes that, oh, well, someone's going to call 911. Oh, they must have done it already, right? Like you need a little bit of like someone to point and say, hey, if this is the direction we're going in, 
I think it would be helpful if you did this. What do you think? Yeah, ownership. And yeah. That's really where I hope we can contribute because my worry is that I see a lot of conversation around like, oh, well, if we're decentralizing, we'll make things totally open. And then everyone will have access to resources and, um, you know, whether it be like social media accounts or the website or whatever it is, and there will be no sort of coordination or cohesion. And so to give people an example, like if, if all Polkadot contributors have access to the social media account, they're, for better or for worse, going to want to either push kind of their idea of like what the Polkadot message could be or push their own project. And it ends up just being a vehicle for promoting the thing that they want to promote rather than trying to build a community to point the brand in any particular direction to try and rally us around a more cohesive message. And so it it's really tough, I think, to, to fully decentralize, to make everything 100% democratic and open. And, you know, Nate and I live in the United States, like, we have a democracy, but we don't really have a true democracy, right? We have a representative democracy. And so that doesn't mean that that's how this needs to look, but there's some truth in the fact that town halls are like wildly chaotic, right? You get a lot of people with a lot of opinions and it's always easier to not change than it is to change. And so you have this bias toward, well, it's always worked when we've focused only on builders or it's always worked when we've done this or I hear a lot of like, well, Ethereum did this in 2015. It's like, well, we're mm -hmm. not Ethereum. That's not 2015. Mm -hmm. Like we have a very different set of problems in front of us. So uh, I, I don't know that, I, like I only have so much input, obviously, on like what the contributors look like. In my ideal, we would have like five or 10 sort of pockets of teams contributing to marketing at the outset across events, across community, across um, like promotion and PR and all of these other really important uh, collectives. And, and BD obviously has a lot to do with marketing because that's where you source a lot of these deals that of course mm. marketing can then, can then talk about. So I hope that we get to a world where our first step is to find some teams that we think are reasonably competent that will do some portion of the things that they say they will do. They have some ability to execute because I think that's important and start there. And over time, Distractive should recruit teams to join the Polkadot ecosystem and help people put stuff into Treasury so that they can contribute to and be paid for their time, um, not necessarily to pull everyone under the Distractive umbrella. So I don't know the easiest way to describe that, but like we see a world where, yes, there's probably going to be a smaller number of teams that contribute at the outset, but that's the starting point. Our end point is to have a varied group of teams, um, but they're not going to all manifest overnight. Not everyone's going to be able to create a company, hire a team, get a bank account, get payroll set up. Like it's just a lot of work to do this kind of thing. I don't know that every team can do it by January 1st or, or February 1st. So that's sort of how I see this playing out. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's almost like, it's almost like a set of stairs uh, in terms of like the process, right? I, I think long term we'd love to see it even more you know decentralized than i think the world that katie and i are, are kind of envisioning what it'll look like for the next year or two years kind of thing we'd love to see you know more and more go whether it's on chain whether it's uh to kind of other agents or smaller teams or things like that but i think that just walking up to a set of stairs and jumping all the way to the bottom that things are things are going to break things are going to go wrong that that's not necessarily the best way to get down that flight of stairs you kind of have to go in this process of, okay, let's take one step at a time. And so really it's around this cohesion and making sure that like, you can't just go from just parity to, to then just like 55 teams all doing different things and having no one really coordinate things. And so we see this world where it's like, yeah, there's probably uh, I don't know, 10 teams, something along those lines. Uh, and then there's obviously you know, if, if there's one specific feature or some specific, um, you know, uh, regional event or something along those lines, I could see there being uh, kind of one-offs where teams, st somebody steps up, a small team, one, two-person team steps up for a specific task. But I think that there needs to be this, Katie calls it the North Star, that, that helps kind of 
work between the community with Web3 Foundation and Parity to say like, look, the, this is where we see this going. We love to have folks kind of build towards that or, you know, uh, come up with other ideas that we want to try and kind of move forward. But just going right to full, you know, uh, to, to full decentralization feels like it's uh, it's a little early in the process. Right. And what, what does this look like more specifically, the role that you envision for Distractive then there? Um, do you... Yeah, do you give guidelines? To, is it a top-down approach where you tell t other teams what to do? Do you manage funds that you give out? Um, can you give us a more like concrete idea of of what you're proposing there? Um, we definitely don't manage funds. I don't think anything will really change in terms of how things are funded, right? Most things do go through the treasury. If there's any possibility to change those things, I would love to see the ability to group things around initiatives rather than isolated, um, you know, rather than just an event to maybe have something around increasing polka dot adoption in a few key countries, um, developer facing. And like, then there's a, a couple events and a couple other things tied to it. Um, and now of course, you know, we, we're moving to the world where you can have multiple beneficiaries of a treasury proposal. And so you could have that sort of structure set up where maybe multiple teams are involved. And that makes things easier from a community perspective because you can decide like, yes, I think adoption in this region is important. Or yes, I think that um, there's, you know, a need to reinvest in the brand or the message or whatever and like make more, again, like macro level decisions rather than, oh, yes, it, this particular hackathon is going to be great. I'm going to vote yes on this. So mm -hmm. hopefully grouping things would be the only change that I would suggest, but I think we're moving in that direction anyway, so that shouldn't be revolutionary. In terms of control, like my intention is not necessarily to have control. I don't think even if I wanted to, that I would be able to. That's sort of the the point. Like other than, you know, me saying, hey, this is where I think we should go. I don't think I'll really fully have any sort of like authoritarian type role because that's quite literally the point of what we're doing. What I mm. see instead is it takes a lot of work to do this stuff. Where do we want to go? What's our strategy for at least the first half of next year? What do we think the message should be? Um, and then, you know, making sure we're getting frequent feedback from the community on that. Once we figured it out, define it, create a bunch of messaging documents, create things for the BD team to march forward with, make sure, I think it's really important that there's some sort of like um, builder or ecosystem team portal so that they can access these things uh, to have resources to march forward with, right? We've always sort of considered the parity BD team to be like the BD team, but really we have lots of BD teams on all of the different parachains who are already sort of preaching Polkadot. How are they talking about us and how do we um, get some cohesion there? So it's, it's really just doing the work that you would normally see come out of like a marketing strategy team. Um, but to hopefully involve people more frequently throughout the process and then to, to sit down and do the work of producing that and make it available to the ecosystem. Right. Well, like you said, it's across a decentralized ecosystem. So to stick with to your example, if you have like a few treasury proposals that are approved about increasing adoption in uh, Southeast Asia or in, in Europe and there is a hackathon in, uh, in I don't know, a Bella, uh, somewhere else. Um, what do you do in that context? Do you like um, contact them and be like, here are some resources or yeah, what? what yeah, you... so there's the, um, like, what are the themes of the um, bounties, for example? And so are those themes tied to where we want to see adoption on the developer side? So it's start there. What, how are we talking about Polkadot? How are we, you know, integrating this with the rest of our developer initiatives? Are you working with other teams in the region? Have you connected with the community team? Um, and then certainly promotion is going to be a key component. And so uh, there's a lot of things that we typically do uh, from an event side. Sometimes there's some like administrative project management that we would want to chip in. So I'd imagine there would probably be some of that. But really, it's to make sure that there's some central repository of resources that folks can access and that we do have some consistency around how we're talking about polka dots. I think I don't I don't know if it's true today, but I know a few years ago when people talked about the message or the brand of polka dot, there was sort of this 
resistance to defining it because it's not up to us and we don't want to give messaging to teens because we don't want to be you know authoritarian and tell yeah, them how yeah. message poke it at yeah and so i think the way that i see it it is a little bit of a shift in that sort of um priority where you would have a, a suggestion or like here's how we've been describing it if you can find a way to to integrate this um this is where we want to go and this is why uh, we don't have control over these things. So there will be, I think, some, um, some. we'll just have to get used to not having very consistent uh, messaging all the time. But I think that's okay as long as teams know where we want to go and, and the research that we've done and why we want to go there. And so we have sort of, again, like this North Star where we want to aim for. Um, but there's really a lot that goes into hackathons. I think our our prioritization would really be much more on the promotion messaging and then bounty creation. If we can tie it into larger developer adoption initiatives. There's been a lot of success stories as well in the Polkadot. I mean, you have a lot of builders, like you said, that are very loyal to it um, and have been part of the ecosystem for a long time. I think there has been here and there a disappointment um, across the lines of, these voices not being supported enough or um, these these use cases, these things that have been built not being amplified enough. Um, do you have any plans or ideas in terms of leveraging success stories or case studies from within the Polkadot ecosystem that already exist and, and could enhance um, its marketing appeal? I think for sure we have to. Um, a, a difference I'd like to see is some of these case studies really talking about polka dot and not necessarily, you know, I've heard, I, I don't know that I've seen any case studies recently because I know the parody team has worked on them. Um, but I've heard in the past things like, Oh, well, we want to focus on substrate or we want to focus on XCM or we want to focus on one functionality or another. Uh, really what I'd love to do is, is just talk more about polka dot consistently and the individual technologies that are used or not used. Those are sort of supporting points, but, um, Polka is sort of the core component. So yeah, I'd love to see more. Um, I know there, there's been a number of really interesting things that the BD team at Perry had worked on. And so I'd love to see some of those things come to fruition, but even the teams that we already have um, that have been in the space for a really long time, they would make really interesting case studies, I think. Mm. So more of the uh, focus on Polkadot, not necessarily on the parachains that have built interesting stuff based on the tech, for example. So I probably have like some bias here in my B2B days, um, but typically how I've done this before is your case study is about your product, right? It's um, in this case, Polkadot. I think in the past, how the team has thought about things is that a product is like a feature on top of Polkadot. So it's really just shifting the way that we're talking about it. And you still would want the ability to like drill down into, okay, but I'm really interested to know what the experiences or maybe the decision factors were for particular components, particular features of Polkadot. But yeah, I think focusing on that top level brand is the most important thing. Um, how about KPIs uh, in general or metrics to track for marketing? I believe this has been a bit tricky as well. Um, if you only talk about impressions and not about engagement, for example, just the just one example. Um, well, how would you measure success of, of Distractive, perhaps under this proposal, but also of marketing initiatives in general for Polkadot? Um, yeah, what metrics or KPIs do you consider uh, most crucial for this? This is always really hard um, because the market fluctuations mess with every KPI you've ever created. So the things that I've started to look at I've basically like made up KPIs. I don't know that they're necessarily the best, but the ones that I'm looking at are things like relative metrics, right? So if you have a grouping of, let's say, you know, a couple other brands that you consider to be competitive from a brand or a social media or a technology perspective, how can you measure your growth relative to their growth over the same period? Um, those I've found to be valuable because what I see on my side is like, I can say Polkadot will grow to, you know, 2 million Twitter followers hmm. this year or next year, really 2024. Um, and that might be realistic if there's a crazy market next year mm -hmm. and a lot of new people flood into the ecosystem and they're interested and we position ourselves well as sort of like the next big technology. Um, but it's probably not realistic if there's, you know, continuation of bear market circumstances. 
And so it becomes really hard to claim success if we do hit them, but it also becomes really hard to claim failure if we don't. So I've mm. tended to look at things like relative um, brand mentions, relative social media follows and that sort of thing as sort of a barometer. But mm. I think the other thing is trying to think more holistically about what we're measuring. So as marketers, we're used to outside of crypto tracking everything. And so in this space, especially for us with Moonbeam in the past, like we've we've intentionally tried to not track too much because we do think that privacy is important and that our users care about that. And so that becomes really tough when you're trying to measure um, where your campaigns succeeded or fell short. And so there are some really interesting tracking tools. I can't remember the names of any of them, but I just talked to one of them last week that are sort of Google Analytics-esque, but with more privacy features built in. Um, so there's some really interesting things I think we can do there. But I would say relative um, relative metrics are sort of the first and foremost. I think output is something that we need to be more accountable for. And I usually hate that. I usually, as a marketer, say like it's not really important what you produce. It's important like what the impact of those things are that you produce. Um, but in this instance, I think it, it's helpful for the community to see what we're doing and to have some sort of like tangible um, record of what we've done. And that we should be accountable for, I think. So some combination of what are we doing? How is Polkadot performing relative to whomever we decide is in our competitive set? And then, mm. of course, like baseline growth metrics we'll keep track of. It's just hard to assign a lot of value depending on market circumstances. I think mm. those relative metrics will be more fruitful. Nate, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, just to echo Katie, we, we KPIs in this space uh, are extremely hard to really set because it's just it, it it it's so market dependent in terms of you know if you're in a traditional business you can look at okay great our growth over the past couple of quarters has been X there's you know Gartner or Forrester has these reports about the growth in this sector for the next year three years five years okay great I can look at what we've done in the past and I can you know from a BD perspective I can hire this many people this is my this is quota this is how it'll all kind of be put together you can look at KPIs like that and in this market it's like shit if the etfs get approved next week all of a sudden everything's gonna blow up but we can't control that we have no say of what gets done so i think the relative piece really making sure that you know polka dot if rising tide is going up polka dot is making sure that we are staying you know with the competitive landscape if not above in some ways but ultimately putting like numbers to that can get very hard so you do need to look at like you know what is the market doing and if the market's going up are we making sure that polka dot is is uh staying relevant and staying you know, at that competitive level. And if not, that's an issue. Um, but outside of the kind of the relative metrics, it gets, it gets really hard to try and like put a number or put numbers uh, kind of on paper from a KPI perspective. Interesting. Did you um, use this approach on Moonbeam as well? Yeah, I mean, look, we 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 uh, beginning of this year we went through kind of looking at okay, what what should the KPIs look like, and and I was really responsible for kind of the BD piece, um, and and continue to be a core contributor to the BD uh, ecosystem on Moonbeam, um, but you know we we had a lot of debates about like okay, great, what what's the growth metric going to look like, and it was well, what about transactional volume? Okay, but what if something comes in and spams the network, but it's a ton of ton of transactions? Are those good transactions? Are those bad transactions? Mm. Does that help the network? Does it hurt the network? And so, you know, you can say, great, we're going to double the transactional volume. Does that actually like do anything? And so the one thing that I, I've kind of come back to is uh, monthly active users or daily active users. To me, that you know, that above anything should be prioritized as like the thing that says, okay, people are coming, people are using, people see value in what you're building. Uh, whereas, I don't know, the TVL, things like that, those can, they can be gamed in many ways. And I just don't think there's much value. So, um, but yeah, we, we went through this kind of exercise uh, from Moonbeam as well. And we'll continue to do that as, as time marches on. I think the okay. daily active users is a good call out too, because it's really hard, right? Like for Moonbeam, we can see daily active wallets, mm -hmm. um, but we can't tie that back to, exactly. okay, well, which applications are bringing them in? Which applications have better retention? Um, mm -hmm. That kind of 
falls to the DAP teams. And if you apply the same concepts to Polkadot, okay, well, we can probably easily see daily active wallets on the relay chain and we can probably see daily active wallets on many of the parachains. Mm-hmm. But like, how do you see that holistically? How do you get that cross section? So it sort of comes back to limitations in the data and how it's available today. And I don't know that that's something that Distractive would be able to solve, but hopefully someone would be able to solve because that's a key mm. barrier to really quantifying the impact of Polkadot today. Mm. It's also a tricky topic from a marketing perspective because, like you said, I believe there is some dishonest uh, reporting on these measures, transaction count and all that. These are not very um, strong KPIs. They can be gamed. Even daily active users, technically daily active wallets, um, And then, like, do you go along with that in order to um, compete on that messaging, you know, or do you try to be more honest and more down to earth, but then you can't really um, report those inflated metrics the same way your competitors are doing? Well, Um, so we can't do anything about other networks. And so I, I tend to not lose sleep over, you know, erroneous or false reporting from other teams. I think what we have is a great asset, which is our community. And so in the example of, you know, a parachain is, um, you know, beefing up the daily active users because they have some automated transactions going through multiple times a day from different wallets. In that instance, there's almost no world in which I'm going to be able to figure that out, right? Like we have to have someone sort of point it out to us. And then hopefully that would cause us to change the way that we're looking at these metrics or calculating things. Um, but it is, it's, it's not a thing that marketing can solve in and of itself by itself. And so it's tough because it's a huge, huge problem, at least from my perspective in, in being able to get people interested in Polkadot, especially the more um, pragmatic folks who are maybe looking for uh, real usage metrics, but it's really difficult because it can't just be, okay, we produced a dashboard. Here you go. We're all done. It doesn't need to be fluid. It doesn't need to change. It needs to you know, modify criteria when we learn of abuse or maybe need to filter out bad transactions or something to that effect. Yeah, metrics are a tricky one. Uh, I talked to Casper as well um, from Polymac um, on our podcast about that from a financial um, perspective. And yeah, I guess it's, it's the same really for marketing as well uh, in, in, in the Web3 world, in the decentralized world. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really interesting. I think it's a really tough mission uh, you guys are going after. I think it's a lot of work, a lot of coordination, a <laughs> um, lot of sleepless nights, maybe. I don't know, but uh, maybe you're used to it from the Moonbeam days. I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're definitely used to it. Uh, we're excited for the challenge and you know, we're, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see where this goes. We're, we were just, uh, the first step was kind of taking into the community, getting a sentiment kind of check essentially, um, you know, and, and engaging with the community, making sure that, you know, people understand kind of what we're, what we're trying to do. And then, uh, we'll be engaging hopefully with the, the Web3 foundation, uh, over the coming weeks. So we'll see, uh, uh, but we're, we're at least excited, uh, about kind of the, the opportunity here and, you know, we, we feel strongly about, you know, um, kind of getting Polkadot back into where we believe it should be in the realm of, of kind of the heavyweights in the industry uh, yeah. and making sure that, you know, we're doing everything we can to, to do that. I right. think too, because we're sort of in the throes of it right now, it's easy to lose the significance of what's happening, but at its core, hopefully this is a really net positive event for Polkadot. There's going to be some chaos Um, but ideally, like we end up with a reinvigoration of polka dot marketing and branding and sort of everything that comes out of the various teams contributing to polka dot. So this could be really good and really interesting. And we certainly haven't seen a team approach decentralization quite like this. Um, so I think, you know, this conversation in six months, hopefully will be, you know, oh, wow. Okay. I'm glad that we got through that phase, but also (laughs) how far we've come. I think um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, organizational problems we need to figure out, but hopefully we'll also solve for some of the problems that the builder teams are facing in terms of um, bearish sentiment and, and sort of lack of enthusiasm. Hopefully we can help solve for some of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great moment for this. Agree. A um, uh, great moment for a turning point in, in a lot of ways. Um, any last words? Um, I'll put up, we'll put up the f- link to your forum post in the show notes. Um, but any, any last words in terms of maybe 
how um, people can make their voice heard on your initiative or um, uh, learn more about Distractive and things like that. Certainly feel free to comment on the forum posts. That's sort of the most consolidated way to do it. We have also been talking to folks individually, um, both in the sense of providing feedback on our proposal, but also seeing if there's a way that they can contribute to Distractive themselves or to Polkadot as a separate entity. Um, so please consider all of those things fair game. If you want to start your own organization and you just want our thoughts on how we have done it over the last year, we're happy to do that. We're happy to talk about distractive. Anything that you think would be helpful, we want to be sort of a resource for the community in that regard. The same, the same. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're just excited to have people engage uh, and, you know, we'll answer any questions that go up there as best we can. And um, But happy to help any teams that are thinking about being an agent or, uh, you know, kind of adding value uh, uh, in going through this process. We want to be supportive. We want to engage. We want to learn. Um, just feel free to reach out. Lovely. Well, thank you for coming on the show and um, yeah, all the best to you and uh, Distractive. Yeah, thank you. This was a great conversation.